Hi guys and welcome to Linear Coordinate Geometry, a Method 3 and 4 course. If you're sitting there watching going, what, what, what's Method 3 and 4? Don't worry about it, it's Coordinate Geometry. It is universal to just about everything and it is so good to have you here. Now before I zip off into this mathematical excitement that really won't start, um, if you're new, hi, welcome, thanks very much for joining, do me a favour. Red arrow over there, oh, asking you to subscribe. Um, yep, it seems really needy but... Uh, to know that people are watching is really, really useful. Um, saves me sitting in a room talking to myself, thinking I'm slowly going mad talking about mathematics. Trust me, I should be doing food review videos. I would be so much better loved than a maths teacher. Anyway, what's this video about? Well, linear coordinate geometry. And as you can see from the red arrow that is highlighting above, it basically is gonna go into much of the stuff you've done previously in year 11 and maybe even earlier. Distance between two points, midpoint of a line segment, gradients of lines, equations of lines, yeah, yeah. already asleep. <clears throat> Very hard to make this one funny, by the way. But uh, it is important to know that actually the, uh, the learning from this video is used throughout the course. So because method three and four builds on methods one and two, it's an idea that uh, we spend a little bit of time recapping the work, but not in any great depth. So that's why possibly this video is quite useful because I get to reteach it, you get to watch it, and hopefully apply the information. So I suppose the big thing here is that knowing a bit of Pythag, a bit of trig, is gonna be really, really helpful. What I've drawn here is literally a Cartesian plane with two points on it. Uh, negative 2, 5 and 4, 8, which is awesome. And that's going to scaffold the whole learning for this video. And you're going to say, well, well, how? And I'm going to say, well, first thing I notice is whenever I'm given two points, and whether it's two points on a graph, two points in a question, or whatever else, if I have a point here and a point here, the first thing my brain does is it tries to join those together. Now, the second I see that slanted line, I'm like, ooh, hold on a moment. I can do gradients, I can do lines, I can do Pythag, I can do trig. And you're gonna say, how on earth can I do Pythag and trig? I can turn this into a right angle triangle. And the great thing here is if I know that that point is negative two, five, for example, and this point here is four, eight, and we may as well stick with the ones in my question then what is a coordinate? It's nothing more than a horizontal and a vertical movement from the origin. So what I know is that this point here starts at negative two, this point here finishes at four, so I must have moved six units that way. Oh, hold on a moment, I've got a length. Oh yes, and then likewise, I know that for the first coordinate, I'm five above the origin, the second coordinate, I'm eight above the origin, which must mean I've moved three units that way. Now, I don't know about you, but my brain is now already giving me gradients because I do rise over run, it's doing three squared plus six squared and, and having a field day there, it's doing the inverse tan of three on six, and that's the whole point. My advice to you is whenever you have got two coordinates, Either quick paper sketch, or if you've actually got the sketch, draw a line between them and start thinking Pythag and tree, because it's gonna come in really, really useful. So I suppose the first thing says, find the distance between the two points. Right, so I've got minus two and five, and I had uh, four, eight. And actually, although I've scrolled it off the page, that's pretty much what I'm gonna use now. So I'm gonna draw a right angle triangle because I know the distance between two points is basically finding that distance there. It's finding the length of a hypotenuse and length hypotenuse Pythag. I'm gonna use a squared plus b squared equals c squared or a squared equals b squared plus c squared, whichever you know variation of that formula you currently use. So what do we say? We knew the horizontal distance went from negative two to four or as reversing it for the camera, negative two to four. So that was six units. We knew that the vertical distance went from five to eight, which was three units. And so a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared, which is really upsetting a lot of Australians now because we go c squared equals a squared plus b squared. Ah. So I know a is my hypotenuse, which is x squared, which is three squared plus six squared, which gives me that x squared is nine plus 36. And continuing over here to give myself some room, x squared is equal to 45. So x must be equal to the positive or negative square root of 45. And as such, we can't have a minus length. So my value of x is equal to the square root of 45. Can anything divide into there? Uh, 9, 18, 27, 36, 45, nine can go into there. So I can write that in simplified third form as the square root of nine times nine, 18, 27, 36, 45 times five, 
So x is equal to 3 root 5. And there we go. That is the distance between my two points. All I've used is a bit of Pythagoras theorem. Find the midpoint of that line segment. Well, again, let's write the coordinates down. Negative 2, 5, and 4, 8. Now, again, a shortcut to find the midpoint of anything. If I wanted to know what number lay between 7 and 94, the quickest way to do it is actually to add the two numbers together and halve it. That will always give you the midpoint. That's what the average is of two things. When you add two numbers together and halve it, it's giving you the midpoint or the average. So to find the midpoint of a line segment, I'm going to take my two x values and add them together. So I'm going to do negative 2 plus 4 and then halve it. And that will give me my x value. And then I'm going to do my y value, which is 5 plus 8 and halve it. And again, now in the textbook and everywhere you see, there will be formulas for this. But what you'll notice is I don't remember formulas. I've already remembered Pythag when I was 13 years of age. Why do I now need to learn x is equal to square root of x2 minus x1 all squared plus y2 minus y1 all squared? Trust me, that's the formula. Whoa, when I can actually just use Pythag. Likewise for this midpoint. If I know what the midpoint is, just add the two points together and halve them. So my midpoint would give, well, minus 2 plus 4 is 2, and half it is 1. And then 5 plus 8 would give me a grand total of 13. Divide that by 2, it gives me 13 on 2. Now, interesting, I'm going to leave that as 13 on 2. When you're asked for a coordinate, make sure you write it in the brackets and with the comma. Sloppy notation, particularly for methods 3 and 4, is absolutely frowned on and jumped on and marks are taken away for sloppy notation. More on that in different videos. Okay, find the gradient of the line. All right, so I've got, once again, minus 2, comma 5 and 4, comma 8. And do you notice how the first part of this question, when I ended up with the right angle triangle, that had 3 and 6. I'd already done the hard work. That initial sketch now is scaffolding the rest of my learning for me. So gradient is rise over run. So I now know that my gradient, which by the way we write in MFs as M. I have no idea why. It's something to do with Barry thinking this would be a funny. <laughs> Let's not call it G. That would be gradient. Let's have M. Because M, anyway. Gradient is rise over run. And you would never leave that. Again, another huge mistake in Method 3 and 4 is the number of people who do not cancel down or simplify to its lowest terms. If you left that as 3 over 6 in an exam, sadly you would lose your answer mark. The methods examiners are not there to finish the question for you. You have to finish it. And I went to a conference with them and they were quite specific about that. Oh, I'm waving my pen. Look at that. Oh, I became very teacher. So three on six becomes one half and therefore the gradient is a half. We're zipping through this. Find the equation of the line. Now, again, I'm going to leave the next part just so I can remember all the values because I'm getting old. The equation of a line. Now, I don't know about you, lots of people say, oh, the equation of a straight line is given by y equals mx plus c. And I, I am like, no, no, that's horrific. Yes, you can use it, but lots of mistakes are made. One formula I have remembered is this. y minus y1 is equal to m x minus x1. That's the equation of a straight line. When you're given two pieces of information, one piece of information you have to be given is the value of m, hold on a moment, m, gradient, which you may already have. And then this x1, y1 business is just one coordinate that fits on the line. Well, again, if we look up here, what have they actually told me? They've given me two coordinates that are already on the line. So I'm ahead. Yay! All I need to do is substitute that into my equation, rearrange it, and I'm going to get my y equals straight away. So let's do that. y minus, what coordinate I'm going to use? Let's use 4, 8 because it's got no negative signs in it, and then I know that I'm not going to make any transcription errors or, or, or mistakes along those lines. So y minus y1. Now, the number of people here who put 4 is terrifying. Again, why do you think people put 4? Because it's the first thing in the equation, and so your mind automatically goes to the first part of that coordinate. Please don't. It's the y value, which is 8, is equal to m. We know the gradient was a half of x minus x1, which is 4. All right, we can't leave it that way because an equation of line has to be y equals. So that becomes y minus 8 is equal to half x minus 2. I'm going to add 8 to both sides. Let's do that over here. y is equal to a half of x minus 2 plus 8. I know there's a lot of work in now, but I just wanted to show you step by step. You can miss out steps if you need to. Just don't miss out the answer, obviously. And there we go. We have my graph as y equals 1 half x plus 6. 
Okay, find the equation of the line which is parallel to the line above. Now there are certain words in maths that I'm looking for and parallel and perpendicular are those. Here we have the word parallel. For a line to be parallel, they're never gonna meet. And as such, the trick there is to say, well, I now want a line with the same gradient as the previous one. Oh, okay, so we now know that M is gonna stay the same, um, but is now gonna pass through a new point. If we look at the previous part, we know that so long as I have a gradient and a point, I can use this y minus y1 equals mx minus x1. And so therefore, if I have y minus y1 equals mx minus x1, do I know my m? Yes, because it's got to be parallel to the line before. And the gradient of the line before was a half. So I know now my m is a half, x minus, but what am my point? I've got to know a coordinate. What I've given it to you in the question. And again, a trick here in mathematics is what information they give you in the question. Now, what I mean by that is they'll try and trick you. Again, Barry is at it again, but he'll try to trick you by saying things along the lines of, oh, it passes through the y-axis at a point four. Well, that's just a way of saying zero comma four, or they'll say it passes through the x-axis, or there is an intercept of seven. All sorts of language here, but you've just got to see that as a coordinate that they're trying to tell you. So I've got my x value is 4 and my y value is 4, which is good. So there's my x value of 4, y minus 4. And in exactly the same way as I did before, multiply the brackets, a half x again minus 2. This case, I'm going to add 4 to both sides. So y is equal to a half of x minus 2 plus 4. And so y is equal to a half x plus two. Now, if I was to plot that on my graph using, I don't know, GeoGebra or using Desmos, then life is good. I actually will find out that that will be parallel to the previous line. But there's another way of knowing. And if we look at our previous uh, question, what do we notice here? That's plus six and that's plus two. And that's the y-axis intercept. So this second equation I've just done now goes through two plus two and the graph above it goes through uh, six. And we notice that both of these have a gradient of a half and so they will be parallel. Scrolling up, find the equation of the line which is perpendicular. And there we go. There is the other word that I'm looking for. A same process as before, but what it wants now is the line perpendicular. We know one thing, that when you have m1 times m2, they're equal to negative 1. And you're going to say, what on earth does that mean? And I'm going to say, when I have two lines which are perpendicular to each other, that means that they are right angles to each other. That if I know that that's gradient m1, and I know that has a gradient of m2, if we multiply those two together, they will always give me negative 1. Now, I like to think of it in a different way. I like to say, well, m2 is equal to minus 1 over m1 and that really confuses people but when you take one over something you're actually doing the reciprocal you're flipping it that's what one over does it reciprocates it the negative literally turns a negative into a positive or a positive into a negative so if i know my previous gradient was a half for example then i'm going to take a half flip it upside down so it becomes two on one and then i'm going to bang a minus sign in front of it oh hold on a moment i've just done some of the hard work so we know again, we're looking for a gradient now. My gradient's perpendicular. As I said, my gradient M1 was equal to a half. So my gradient M2 must be two on one, flip it upside down and change the sign. So my new gradient is negative two. We'll just leave it as negative two. It's passing through the midpoint of the two points given. All right, scroll back up, remind myself what the midpoint was, one and 13 on two. So my coordinate as given is one and 13 on two. And so once again, y minus y1 is m x minus x1. And so y minus 13 on two is equal to my gradient of negative two multiplied by x minus my x1. Now I've got a fraction in there. I don't like that fraction. I'm gonna multiply absolutely everything by two for the moment, just to make life easier for me. Multiply out all the brackets, so I get 2y minus 13 is equal to minus 4x plus 4. Don't forget, negative times negative is positive. Add 13 to both sides, gives me 2y is minus 4x plus 17. And now I can divide by 2 to get my y on its own. So y is equal to negative 2x plus 17 on 2. Now, you're going to say that was a lot of working out, but actually there's probably a good 40% of people watching these videos who are actually going, ah, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Now, I don't like fractions. I don't like them at all. I don't think anybody does, and I'm a maths teacher. Head of maths, that's even more weird. 
But I know that if I've got to divide by two somewhere in my equation, I can multiply every single term by two and turn it into something I do like. And it might add an extra line of working, but in an exam, imagine all the marks you're gonna gain. Last part of this is tangent and gradient of a slope of a line. I love this. This is, this is something that sort of, when I first learned this, not too long ago, uh, it blew my mind. If I have, say, a line I'm going through here, I don't know what the equation is, let's call it uh, y is equal to 3x. What do I know about that line? Well, the first thing I can see is obviously it goes to the origin and I know it has a gradient of three. But the question is, knowing that, can I find that theta? And lots of people go, nah, too hard. And I'm gonna say, actually, you already know all the information from about year nine. Go back to my right angle triangle. Now, if I had that as six and I had that as three, then we now know we can find my rise over run, yes? Because it's a right angle triangle and we know the rise over the run is equal to the gradient. So M in that situation is three on six or a half. But hold on a moment. Right angle triangles are also good for trigonometry because I know if I have a theta in there, otherwise known as an angle, I have an opposite and an adjacent. So I now know that tan theta is equal to three on six. Well, that was the opposite over the adjacent, but I know the opposite was also known as the rise, and the adjacent was also known as the run, but that's equal to gradient. And yes, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. I actually know that m is equal to tan theta. My gradient is equal to the tan of theta. So if I wanted to find this angle here, for my example, I'd say, well, hold on a moment. I know then that tan theta is equal three. Theta is equal to the inverse tan of three. And banging it into my calculator, which I'm not gonna do, uh, will give me my answer. And so if you're ever asked to find the value of the angle that a line makes with a horizontal, all you need to know is the gradient. Wow. Too much. I've got to go and have a lie down. This this was too much. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, yes, I'm going to ask you once again, if you haven't already done so, can you subscribe? Can you send a message out there and get your friends to subscribe as well? Let them know. I know there's other things out there and people keep telling me Khan Academy's fabulous. Yes, I'm sure it is, but uh, there's a little guy out here as well trying. Um, if you want to then, subscribe. There's that little doohickey. Otherwise, I will hopefully look forward to seeing you in another video. There's a video loading over there, which will be a similar level of this one. Um, enjoy. Um, otherwise, I'll see you next time. Take care. Mass Guru out.